I have to ask you about your collaboration with Glenn Gould on uh -huh. um, Cantata BWV 54. Wiedersteher Doctor Zünder 54. Well, he performed that one for TV as part of Glenn Gould's. That's right. He did this little. I always thought it was. He wanted to do what Bernstein had done a bit, you know, sort of educational. It was Sunday afternoon, and anyway, I was, I'd never sung with him before. And, well, he, first of all, he didn't work with singers much. And uh, I guess the, the invitation came through my, it wasn't directly from him, but through my agent at the time. And I remember thinking, oh, wouldn't that be nice to do that? And I had sung that already mm -hmm. um, with here in New York with Fritz Rico who had a, um, a very a pickup orchestra but very good New, New York players who did concerts in Washington Square Park in the summertime and I, I can't imagine singing that outdoors but I did <laughs> and enjoyed doing that so, I mean, I, I sung it, and I knew it, and I thought it was a great piece of music and beautifully suited, for the most part, to the, my, the range of my voice. And um, so when the offer, the invitation came to do it, it was to be a television program, and that's what I thought only that it was. And uh, I remember going up, and I was in up to Toronto where... Glenn lived, and I remember going to his apartment. I was there a couple of days before the actual performance, and um, I had friends who, with whom I stayed. And uh, going over it with him, I remember going into his uh, living room. He lived in a very nice apartment in a fine building up there in Toronto big it was like a house really and going into the sitting room and there were three grand pianos two were pushed up against the wall and beautiful instruments the look of them and then a, a, a rattle trap of a instrument over near the window and of course that's the one that he went to and that's the one it was a chickering I think and it was one that he liked, that's what he practiced on. And, of course, he had that funny little chair that was a foot high instead of the usual height. And so the, the his keyboard and the hands were about where his chin level, you know, when he was playing. And uh, we just started right out. He said, well, should we just? I said, yes, just start. we'll just do it. So I think we went through the whole thing, and he just couldn't get over the piece of music. And... He said, it's fabulous, isn't it? I said, indeed it is. He said, if you take that opening chord and stretch it out, it's like a 13th chord. Whoever starts a piece of music with a chord like that? Nobody. And, um, you know, it was he, he was just always stopping and taking notice of what Bach had done here and how he did that. And he liked to play it because he was playing trying to play, he had a score, playing all the parts. He wasn't interested. He never did play, even on the recording, a real continuo part, as we know it. Who knows? You know, Bach might well have played that kind of a continuo, where they play melodies and all kinds of things. And he had, we, were, we rehearsed, as I said, in his apartment with this piano. And when we got to the studio to um, uh, do the show, uh, he had what's ca what he called a harpsa piano. Did you, have you ever, did you ever hear that? Never seen it was, well, there weren't, there weren't one but one, his. <laughs> and it was, well, it was like, you know, putting thumbtacks in, in the, the hammers of the piano, it made... Everybody's heard that and knows what that sounds like. This was not. It, it had staples, like little staples put in. So it made a, a, a slight harpsichordy sound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he, he, I was appalled and thought, what, terrible. What are you going to, why, why would he do that? I didn't tell him, but I mean, I just was stunned. 
and uh, later on he 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 thought that that was going to be taken up by Steinway and they would develop that uh, because it it made a harpsichord like sound but you could do things with it that you couldn't do with a harpsichord you know the touch could make a difference in you know the quality of the sound that came out and he thought it it was better and of course it was never picked up by anybody and a lot of people are were stunned when they hear it mostly i i don't even think about it when i hear it now it doesn't my mind is not on that at all but uh we did and he was very good uh, with the information that he wanted to give to the audience. There wasn't an audience there. You know, it was a listening audience. And uh, But he, he wasn't, like Bernstein was, it was just like talking as I am now, you know, in your living room. And uh, Glenn was not. It was a more stilted. Um, he wasn't as good at it right. as uh, Leonard was. And but he was knowledgeable. Oh my, he had a lot of good things to say, and uh, never had a piece, not a note of music in front of him. Just sat there, and, and he played all the parts you could hear. You know, when he's playing the, doing the his idea of continuum. He played a lot of different things there, and uh, great to work with. I liked him a whole lot. And he, uh, in those days, he was like Benjamin Britten was to the BBC, Mr. English Music. Mm -hmm. He was Mr. Canadian Music in Canada. And they gave him everything that he wanted. You know, he had whatever he came up with, they somehow managed and did it. And he had, in this terrible studio where it was given, low ceilinged and it was like singing into an upholstered armchair it had no sound at all dead i hated it i hate a room like that and it also was very dusty and hot the lights were very very bright and they were painting sets to make them look like the interior of a church and that shows on television you'll see these you know arched windows and things it wasn't at all. I mean, they were all flats painted. And uh, I remember thinking, oh, what a terrible place to sing. And the microphone, one microphone I had was up in front of me, but, but above my head by uh, uh, many feet, really. And I thought, is anybody going to hear me? I mean, I could hardly hear myself in this terrible acoustic and um I, so i remember and i did this wasn't the first time because i've done it before i can remember in when we did some recordings i, I used to stand on a hymnal mm -hmm. or two to be nearer where i thought you know i should be to the microphone because the engineers and people they're busy taking care of everything else you know they can't watch all that anyway i I saw the mic up there, and I so I directed. I lifted my head. I always sang with my head up, but I never not not to the extent that it's in that thing. And uh, uh, I remember when it was over, we we rehearsed it. You know, with the, the orchestra hadn't seen it, and uh, I think we did it twice. And I never should have sung constantly. As, it's a very difficult piece of music, you know, there's a lot in it. And, uh, I, of course, I, I didn't save myself at all, and I always felt that by the time I got to the end of that, when we did the actual performance, I was tired. I could tell it. I mean, I knew I was at the time. And when it was over, I thought, wow, I'm glad that's done. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Never dreamed that it was being saved on a film. Never knew anything about that. It was just, it was, I thought it was a live television program. Now, it might have been 
done on a tape and broadcast at another Sunday. I, can't, I don't know. But my, my recollection of the time was that it was a live performance. And for that one thing, well, I've come to find out, you know, Glenn never did anything that wasn't recorded. Nothing. Everything. He had in his own home all of these recording things and machines. And I remember one of the rehearsals I went to, he met me at the door laughing and he said, Oh, you've got to come. You, gotta, you have to hear this. You're, ha, ha, ha. We have to hear this. So I went back into the room where he had all kinds of equipment, you know, every kind of electrical recording thing in the world. And he got out of, uh, it was a disc, a recording, and he, he said, I want you to hear this. He said, tell me what who it is and, and what it is. Well, he put it on. It was an old record, very scratchy. But it sounded like a, a street band. I said, it sounded, he said, well, you're right, it is a street band. But where? I said, well, I don't know, probably early American or German or whatever. He said, well, you're getting warm, you're getting warm. And then he said... It's the same conductor who is also the composer. Who is it? Who is it? And he was laughing the whole... Many mistakes on this thing. When you hear it, terrible bloopers. On, <laughs> funny to listen to. And I, you know, I never play that game very well. You know, who is that? What's the, I just don't. And I said... He said, the, you know, the most far, foremost co uh, composer of our time. And I said, Stravinsky. He said, no, 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 no. Richard Strauss. He was so f amused by that, that and who knows when that was done, but probably he was a kid or something, you know, when it was, <laughs> they did it. But it was very, f and he was very um, touched by that and laughed and thought it was so funny. It was. <laughs> Thank you. 
Lass dich nicht in Sachen blenden, denn die Worte sehne schenden. Schief mein Fluch, der tödlich ist. Lass dich nicht in Sachen blenden, Die hart verruchte Sünden, 
ist zwar von außen wunderschön, allein man muss hernach mit Kummer und Verdruss viel Ungemach empfinden. Von außen ist sie gut, doch will man weitergehen. Zeigt sich nur ein leerer Schaden und übertütes Grab. Sie ist in Sodensäpfeln gleich und die sich mit derselben Garten gelangen liegt in Gottes Reich. Sie ist als wie ein scharfes Schwert, das uns durch Leib und Seele, durch Leib und Seele fährt. Oh, oh, oh. 